is a graduate of medical school from uh, Fudan University, uh, Shanghai, China, and then he go to uh, got his uh, master degree and PhD in uh, Michigan, United States. Uh, after that, he moved back to uh, Shanghai to be the professor at uh, Fudan University. Okay, so please, professor. Thank you, all, Eric, um, <clears throat> and also about I'm. Uh, Honor to uh, uh, give a pre this uh, presentation. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, <clears throat> thank you. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, endometriosis, cancer driving mutations, and also uh, malignant uh, transformations. Now, we do know that endometriosis is a benign kind of cardiac disease affecting most women of reproductive age. It's usually it's that uh, estrogen dependent. It's also considered as a, an inflammatory condition. And uh, it's actually also benign also has, has some uh, cellular behavior that's very similar to cancer, for example, invasiveness, angiogenesis, and also uh, recurrence. And it is well known there's a link be, uh, between uh, endometriosis and ovarian cancer. And in fact, the Samson um, first reported that the malignancy induced by endometrioma in 1925. But the overall incidence of endometriosis induced malignancy actually is very low, range from um, 0.7 to 1%. And most of them actually involve ovaries, another one quarter of them actually. Uh, involves actual ovarian tissues. And that's uh, something that we already uh, know. The, in fact, that the, uh, the awareness of this link is actually was heightened by this uh, paper published in a very high profile journals. And in fact, that the, uh, <clears throat> we um, do, do know that the, the increase of risk is, is uh, very moderate. And in fact, this is actually the, uh, what we call um, funnel report. It looks like a funnel. Essentially, it collects all the published studies on the link between ovarian metriosis and also um, ovarian cancer. And essentially, if there's a publication bias, then essentially you, know, you don't see any um, negative uh, publication reports. But if there's a both positive reports and also negative reports, you will see that the, they're mostly uh, look like this, like, like, like a funnel. And if there's no risk, essentially it will gravitate it to a zero. And as small studies, they usually tend to scatter, have more wider variation. But uh, bigger studies, they tend to have a smaller variation. They eventually uh, gravitate it to the true uh, relative risk is essentially the same thing for the uh, standardized incidence rate. And you can see that this is actually our, our relative risk is 1.6 is here. And so it's he, here, so probably it's going to be like a 1.3 and a 1.4, so it's not much actually. And same thing for the um, prospect, uh, prospective studies, uh, standardized incidence uh, ratio. And that's why I think that uh, five years ago, actually, I had a, I invited, being invited to, to write a review paper. Essentially, my point is the relative increase is moderate, but the absolute risk is still low. And because incidence is low, so there's no screening test can ensure a high accuracy. And so once you get a positive result, it's, it's most likely uh, a false alarm. So in, in this case, no screening is necessary. But it comes to a, su a complete surprise when three years ago, actually, the, um, a group of people published in a paper in the England Journal of Medicine reporting that the endometriosis, they actually find cancer-associated mutations. And following that paper, there's also uh, several other papers reported uh, similar results. And the nice papers are published by, by a Japanese group also published, uh, said that this clonal expansion and diversification of cancer associated mutations in endometriosis as well as in normal endometrium. And essentially that um, of course we know that the cancer associated mutation is actually uh, euphemism. And it's actually referring to cancer 
driver mutations. It refers to the mutations of genes that are implicated in pathways critical to the propensity of tumor cells for growth, survival, and metastasis. Cells with uh, CDM actually have selective advantage, and so they will eventually overrun and, and take the whole, the, the whole tissue. That's actually opposed to um, passenger mutations. They essentially, no essential mutation, not essential mutations, they're just, uh, they get lucky, they just, um, but they have no selective advantage. So you can see that this is actually the, the New Guinea Journal uh, paper reported that in many uh, um, patients with deep endometriosis, you can see that they had, uh, a lot of them actually had uh, driver mutations. And in um, a Japanese paper, they actually reported similar things uh, in ectopic endometrium, but as well as in utopic endometrium. And they believe that the actually, at the uh, endometriosis, endometriosis started with the mutations, cancer mutations, within the utopic endometrium. And then gradually, uh, by uh, retrograde menstruation, they actually spread these uh, tissues, uh, carrying uh, mutation carrying uh, tissues to the um, uh, peritoneal cavity and uh, induced endometriosis. And I have to say that the actually uh, six years earlier, I mean, several years earlier, the actual some the papers essentially reported the same thing. Um, but it's also reported like one, uh, a reader, one uh, A is actually is a known cancer driver, uh, cancer driver genes. But in, unfortunately that paper actually was essentially that uh, didn't take notice. Uh, so uh, there are lots of reasons. And we know that somatic mutations of cancer are intimately related. And there's lots of words actually like oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, lots of heterozygosity, and they're essentially uh, initially are described in cancer uh, settings. And lots of uh, uh, techniques uh, like FISH or CGH, and also uh, microarrays are uh, developed in the cancer research area. We also have germline uh, mutations in cancer, for example, BRCA1 and breast cancer, ovarian cancer is also intimately uh, linked. And not only endometriosis, but also adenomyosis. And just uh, last year, there's a paper uh, I reported that the in adenomyosis is also cancer driver mutations, KRAS, actually. So now, given this, that's a natural, there will be questioned. You know, should we get concerned? Because it's a benign disease, but all of a sudden it actually has cancer driver mutations. So the question is, do lesions come from um, the uh, utopic endometrium carrying the uh, mutations? Would uh, the CAMs in, in metriotic lesions confer increased risk of cancer? And this actually certainly will be interest to physicians and patients as well. Now, how often do CAMs occur? Will all patients with endometriosis have uh, CAMs in the lesions sooner or later? And ovarian endometriosis is well documented to be linked with ovarian cancer, but why actually ovarian endometriotic uh, lesions seldom lead to cancer? That's another kind of question. What clinical implications, if any, do um, CAMs have? And when a patient with endometriosis is found to have CAMs, should she be concerned or worried? I mean, these are all very practical questions. Now, <clears throat> To understand this question, that, that we have to understand that uh, how come that the CAMs are suddenly uh, uh, discovered. Uh, in fact, that the, the search for somatic mutations in mitosis actually started in the last century I and mean, during the early 1990s. And in fact, that we actually uh, used a, a, tech, a CGH technique to report that the, there's a genomic alterations in ectopic a utopic endometrium um, in women with endometriosis. Essentially, that you can see that in the blood is presumed to come from germline. It has two alleles, but in endometriotic lesions and as well as in utopic endometrium, the other one allele is actually lost. It's, a, it's actually, it's referred to the uh, uh, LOH. And, <clears throat> and also, um, I think that the, it didn't, uh, uh, Pan out that simply because there's a lot of conflicting results. 
and, and also not, not, not much uh, mutations, and very few uh, CAMs, and, functional, and also their functional significance is usually unclear. And also they're usually limited by technological constraints, for example, poor detection rate, so there's lots of high uh, errors. And also uh, uh, they did not use microdissection. Essentially there's a mixture of different cell types that actually diluted signal to uh, noise ratio. So <clears throat> these CAMs are now discovered simply um, because of next generation sequencing technology and also microdissection. For example, that uh, uh, there's always a, a question that the endometrial lesion is like cancer is actually monoclonal or, or polyclonal. And uh, at that time, there's a lot of debate. And we actually used, uh, actually, that was the first time that we used the microdissection. And these are the, the uh, epi <coughs> epi epithelial cells, actually, glandular epithelial cells. By microdissect these uh, uh, gland glands, you can actually get all the epithelial cells. And with this, we can actually resolve that the endometriotic lesions are actually uh, monoclonal. So each focus is actually monoclonal, but different uh, foci are actually uh, 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 probably come from different clones. And <clears throat> to understand a mutation, we have to understand the genomes. And we can see that the, the, the genome essentially is the, uh, consists of uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes plus about uh, uh, about 1% of uh, mitochondrial or genome. In, in, in its totality, it's, a session, um, it's uh, 3.1 billion base pairs. And if you think about it, we all um, human beings started with a fertilized egg, but a human beings actually composed of 10 to the power of 13 uh, and also 14 cells. And so it's actually, these come to successive uh, uh, cell divisions. Now, each cell division is akin to a Xerox process. And although the uh, Xerox uh, process, the, the replication has a high fidelity, uh, uh, the mutation rate is still very low, but the chance of no mutation occurred in one cell division, the chances are very, extremely, extremely low. It's, it's, it's uh, essentially, same to the tossing of a coin uh, 45 times consecutively, you always get heads up. So, so that's, a, that's a very, very small probability. So, so in other words, the, in one cell division, you almost surely will get uh, mutations somewhere. So <clears throat> as the de uh, detection error uh, decreases, new mutations, more, more people will be discovered. And I like this picture very much. I think that the, essentially, that this, actually that's 20 years ago that uh, people were thought that they were not, not much uh, cancer mutations in normal uh, uh, people. And, but as the, they push the boundary, use the more advanced technology like uh, NGS, they actually found that the, in fact, all cells in all people, they have somatic mutations including cancer driver mutations. And this is actually a very nice paper that uh, they used to look at the eyelid. It's essentially, essentially normal. Um, <clears throat> eyelid actually received lots of uh, a UV light and UV light is actually known to be uh, damaging to uh, DNAs. So they looked at four uh, healthy people uh, without any disease. And they actually found that the, um, the eyelids actually does a, uh, biopsy, they actually had a different punctures and they sequenced it and find a lots and lots of mutations. And <clears throat> apparently the, uh, uh, especially it's, it's one gets older. And the other uh, nice studies published uh, two years ago is actually they looked at the uh, human esophagus uh, uh, tissues <clears throat> and they essentially found uh, because es es esophagus uh, tissues actually has a very high turnover. And they actually, you can see that the, um, there's essentially, there's an there's a increasing uh, mutation rate with age. Essentially, that the, as uh, <clears throat> the person ages, it will acquire more mutations. Simply because the cell division in itself 
we require the, the replication and replication just like the Xerox process. You, if you uh, <clears throat> make the Xerox, uh, use, this, um, use the successive one as a, a copy, and then you eventually would, uh, would have a very blurred uh, uh, images. And that's exactly what happened. And <clears throat> this is actually um, uh, Bob sees uh, the, the different uh, mutations of small group clones. Uh, some of them are, are, don't have any mutations, but as the person uh, ages, this is 20, 23 years old, 24, 27 years. If you look at the 70 to 75 years old, lots, lots of uh, huge mutations. So that's uh, essentially a very nice picture. And these are actually all cancer driver mutations. You can see as a, one, uh, a person ages, acquire more and more uh, mutation, although the uh, uh, appearance of the, uh, the person still are, are healthy. Now, in terms of in a mutual, uh, essentially, uh, people also reported the same thing, that uh, as person ages, they find more mutations. And <clears throat> another very nice paper is actually published uh, this year in Nature. <clears throat> I probably reported the same thing, that um, first of all, uh, there's a uh, in, in a mutual, normal in a mutual, no uh, pathology. It, it actually finds lots of cancer driving mutations and has actually, um, these cancer driving mutations uh, quickly take over and dominate some of the, these clones. And the other thing is, is age dependency of these uh, accumulation of uh, <clears throat> mutations. Um, another one is point is the uh, <clears throat> published last year essentially that also that you looked at the esophagus epithelia. And the thing is that uh, not only the age, but if you also exposed to a risk factor, for example, drinking or smoking, the mutation rate is actually increases. Okay. So <clears throat> if we can summarize, that's essentially that uh, cancer uh, association mutations can occur in seemingly normal tissues and the amount of CAMs is proportional to increasing age, replicative error, and cell turnover rate, um, and also the amount of exposure to deleterious stresses, for example, UV light, smoking, drinking, maybe also uh, environment, uh, the, the, the um, occupational hazard, and inversely with parity or in vitro. So now we can answer the question, do lesion come from CAMs carrying endometrium, and it's actually very difficult to establish because endometrium is multi, uh, multiclonal. On the other hand, endometriotic lesions are monoclonal. Uh, <clears throat> this actually, that probably, uh, this, uh, the, thanks to the um, paper that almost published almost 20 years ago by a Japanese group, and also our group also reported uh, in 2008, essentially the uh, normal endometrium glands, they actually are composed of different clones. And same thing here, this, actually, this, this, this is actually menstrual debris. And we actually, based on the methylation patterns, you can see that the uh, physically distant uh, uh, patches, they actually are genetically or epigenetically, they're actually distant. So uh, these are the lesions, and these actually, your uh, topic in the medium, they have composed of different clones, probably hundreds or even thousands of different clones. So if you, uh, each clone is actually evolving with time and so is the uh, lesion. So in order to establish that this, this lesion actually comes from this one, a particular clone will be very, very difficult. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so um, there's actually no data to support the camps in utopic endometrium occurred first, or it's actually related to the lesions in Topic in the mutual. In fact, experimental data indicate otherwise because for a perfectly normal utopic in the mutual, for example, uh, rats or maybe a, a, a mouse or maybe a um, baboon, uh, it has a perfect uh, in uh, in the But once you induce uh, in mitosis, sooner or later, they actually will find uh, molecular aberrations in utopic in the mutual. So it actually suggests otherwise. That's once endometriosis <clears throat> is established, well, somehow 
<coughs> impact on the uh, <coughs> utopic individual. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so now we can uh, answer the second question. Why would camps in immature lesions come for increased risk of cancer? Actually, that's not necessarily because even healthy tissues carry camps and cancer is formed when the right type and also the right number of camps are acquired and accumulated. And most lesions carrying camps should be removed, would be removed surgically. And if not, they, they usually uh, the, the patient will receive medical treatment. In this case, the uh, immunotic lesions, they will usually uh, will be in dormancy. And molecular, uh, molecular transformation takes place if they can acquire the right number and type of camps. Yeah. And that actually takes time. So <clears throat> how often do camps occur? That also that, that uh, actually aging, that the replication error, and also for endometrium and ectopic endometrium, menstruation is one. And because there's a tissue injury and there's tissue repair, uh, hyperestrogenism, and this like, because we know that the estrogen is a, a mitogen, and so it will in induce more cell divisions, increased inflammation, and oxidative stress, and also in, including uh, iron overload because of the uh, cyclic bleeding. And also re re uh, reduce our repair efficiency. And it's also being reported. Um, but somehow that the, um, after a person reaches a certain age, becomes old, the cell division rate is actually decreases. Uh, um, so that's another th kind of a counter uh, uh, force. So, <clears throat> So that the question is, will all patients with endometriosis have CAM in the lesion sooner or later? The answer is that if the lesion are kept intact, the risk of molecular uh, transformation is increased, but only very mildly. So, uh, so this would, because it takes, takes time. And as you can see that the patients with uh, endometriosis associated ovarian cancer are usually older than those just one, just with uh, endometriosis, simply because it takes more time. And they're usually younger than those uh, with ovarian cancer, simply because um, they usually complain of uh, you know, bleedings or dysmenorrhea that will actually brought them uh, to medical attention earlier. And also earlier, is, that's, that explains why these women are usually at early stages of ovarian cancer. And in all, I think that the data from Taiwan indicate the incidence of ovarian cancer due to ovarian endometriosis is actually pretty low. So it's essentially, this is uh, the natural history of endometriosis. And the, this is a lesion. Once established, it interacts with the uh, various cells within the lesional environment. And these cells actually undergo uh, epithelial mass and chemical transition, fibroblast to mild fibroblast, trans differentiation, smooth muscle metaplasia, and also fibrosis. And at the same time, they actually accumulate mutations. And if they accumulate uh, cancer drama mutations, if you accumulate uh, uh, enough uh, and the right type, eventually they would uh, uh, finish the uh, molecular, molecular uh, transfer. Uh, uh, transformation. But there's some other uh, uh, counter uh, balance. This medication, uh, keep the, the, uh, the lesion in dormancy, surgical excision, essentially remove these lesions. Aging as well. Uh, aging will slow down the replication rate. Uh, hyper, uh, these are actually uh, positive regulators. So again, this is a lot of uh, uh, positive and negative regulators. So now the question is, why does extra ovarian endometriosis seldom lead to cancer? First of all, of course, we know that's a, a tissue specificity because some tissues like ovary, ovary are more sensitive than others to uh, CAMs and take shorter time uh, for molecular transformation. And on top of that, the local microenvironment is more conducive because Ovaries actually, when you measure the estrogen level, is usually the highest. And also, the in ovarian endometriosis, the, uh, there's one gene that's actually transformed the uh, estrogen to another kind of metabolite, actually has which is highly toxic, and is will result in more uh, 
uh, reactive oxygen species, which are also the uh, DNA damaging uh, agents. And they also experience a higher uh, uh, estrogen receptor beta, which actually uh, in, entails more inflammation than uh, deep in mitosis. And, but on the other hand, patients with uh, um, deep in mitosis, for example, they may have um, complained of more severe pain and they actually see medical attention earlier. So they, they may have their uh, lesions removed before they have a chance for further transformation. So, but given time, uh, these lesions will undergo malignant transformation after accumulating a sufficient number and right type of camps. But on the other hand, if one reaches the certain age, for example, menopause, then the cell division rate will decrease. That also explains why uh, malignant uh, transformation in deep endometriosis or extra ovarian endometriosis is usually much lower. Um, you can see that the, the clinical presentation of uh, the molecular transformation arising from deep intrusions is usually because of uh, pelvic pain, pelvic mass, bleeding. So they usually, uh, people when uh, patients experience this, they usually will go to a medical do doctor. And <clears throat> the other question is, what clinical implications, if any, uh, do CAMS have? Now, because these are mutations uh, and there's permanent, it's very difficult to rectify by pharmacological means. So in this case, that the, the, once the lesion carries a CAM, then it will be more resistant to drug treatment. And that may explain why some patients are more refractory than others to drug treatment, especially a progestin treatment. In fact, this has actually been uh, borne out by uh, a paper um, <clears throat> published last year. They actually looked at the adenomatic lesions and they looked at the uh, KRAS mutations and they found that you, in these lesions, uh, the progestin receptor expression is usually very low. So that explains why they actually don't respond too well to progestin treatment, for example, Dinogest. And they actually did uh, in vitro studies and they found that the, the PR progestin receptor uh, actually is much, uh, much, much uh, uh, lower. And they actually, the, um, they re didn't respond to uh, the uh, Dinogest uh, treatment. So uh, if a patient uh, with immunosuppressor is found to have CAM, should be concerned or worried. I, think that, I, I don't think that's so necessary because as long as the lesions are removed, the risk of molecular transformation is extremely, extremely low. If not, as I think that, uh, medical treatment usually will keep the uh, lesions at bay. And uh, so the cell division uh, is going to be kept into minimal and that's no longer uh, so little chance to acquire more mutations. So in conclusion, uh, cancer social mutations are ubiquitous, even in healthy tissues. And research in this area that uh, shed much needed light onto the pathophysiology and camps occur in mitosis due to replication error and selective pressure thanks to hyperestrogenism, inflammation, iron overload, and oxidative stress. And their presence poses the therapeutic challenge and early in intervention is always advisable, but there's no need to get panic. So um, and in the end, I think that I'll just, um, for more in information, I can, you can probably can read some of the, these publications. I think that I wrote that uh, essentially talked about these uh, um, <clears throat> cancer driver mutations and also this one. Thank you. All right, I'm done. So thank you very much. Uh, this is very, very informative lecture for me. Uh, can you uh, turn on your uh, video? Okay, let me see. Uh... You can stop that. Uh, okay, uh, maybe. Uh, okay. okay, now you're back. Okay. okay. And also audio is okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. 
So, and I have my uh, special guest, uh, he's Professor Willard. He's, uh, he's a pioneer of uh, laparoscopic surgery in Thailand, uh, but I'm not sure if he's uh, with us for now. Professor Willard, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, yes, I can hear you too. Yes, uh, uh, are there any comments, Professor Willard? Uh, it is quite interesting in in the uh, camps. Is uh, to me is a new concept that you can find the uh, the mutation uh, before is is uh, become mutated, and it's related to the age. It's related to the environment exposure by time. Right. This is the things that that, that is actually is nature that that we know. But no one can prove what what had happened. Uh, well, professor, you you uh, you you bring me the the uh, the the answer to, to the theory <laughs> that that we we are in, it's suspicious that uh, what bring the some some of the endometriosis uh, or ectopic in, in endometrium and turn to be malignancy. Finally, right. thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Oops. Have to okay. Yes. Professor Lee, uh, are there any comments or questions? Uh unmute your microphone. Oops. Can you hear me? Yes, of yes, course. Yes, no, loud and clear. Okay, so sorry, I just typed the question there. Uh before the the session starts. Uh, ba basically, uh, I just want to know, uh, uh, to, in my simple mind, uh, endometriosis actually behaves like a cancer. Uh, it spreads, it can invade into tissues, uh, but, and why is it that keeps it from turning cancerous, I've just heard from uh, Professor Kwok the reasons, uh, but is there a simpler way of explaining to patients or my students without going in depth into his lecture, which uh, is so in depth that many of us not in the uh, research and scientific realm of things will understand. So. If I uh, will appeal to Professor Kuo to explain in very simple terms that to, to, for, for my junior doctors, how would I say that uh, it is spreading, but it is still not a cancer? Well, it's for some reason. I think that's the first of all that the um, cancer and endometriotic lesions has lots of uh, similarity. Um, not only because of the uh, invasion, angiogenesis, and also like, like, uh, like recurrence, and also the things I mentioned is the uh, clonality. Like cancer is actually it's monoclonal. And endometriotic lesions is also, for a single uh, focus, it's also monoclonal. But on the other hand, uh, it differs from cancer in the sense that um, it is essentially a wound that uh, unlike cancer, cancer is a, is a wound that nev never heals. But for endometriosis, it's, it's a constantly experienced uh, cyclic tissue injury and repair. So mm -hmm. it goes uh, to the, eventually will, will end up with a fibrotic uh, uh, a tissue. So, so in this case, there's a, there's a, a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oops. Can I ask another question? Quite sure, different. please. Sure, uh, sure, sure. From cancer. Um, you see, I belong to the uh, older generation of doctors when uh, we were in medical school and as a junior doctor, mm -hmm. the only hormones we have to control endometriosis is the simple oral contraceptive pill. Right. Now, what is disturbing to me now is that uh, there are new evidence to show that by using oral contraceptive pills, you actually 
hide the disease of deep and uh, vaginal rectal endometriosis. So, uh, which means to me, something that we have done in the past is awfully wrong. Uh, is that also your opinion, Professor Kwok and uh, Oleric? Oleric? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, in my opinion, that I think this uh, publication uh, from uh, Charles, Charles Chapron group, uh, but I think because of it's not high the lesion, but it's high the, the symptom, right? Because uh, some uh, young girl, young woman, there's a take a pill for decrease the, the symptom to solve the symptom. That sometimes uh, the lesion is not, uh, it's not investigated yet, especially for the deep endometriosis because they are single, there's uh, no uh, sexual intercourse. So the OC pill is high the lesion because they can solve the symptom before the physical examination. This, this is my idea. And by the way, uh, I think we treat the, the patient, we not treat only the, the lesion. So if the OCP can uh, decrease the symptom, I think that that's okay. That okay. Even we uh, leave some uh, lesion. This, this is my opinion. So, how about you, Professor Kua? Um, I think that the, um, it's not too much different from uh, the, the old, uh, uh, old way of treating uh, endometriosis. I think that the um, oral contraceptives are still recommended for those um, patients. Uh, of, course, there are, of course, there's no uh, generation of uh, uh, progestins, for example, dinogens are, are used, but they are more, uh, quite expensive. Uh, um, but not ex expensive. We're talking about fifty dollars a month in in Korea, um, maybe uh, five hundred at, at uh, Renminbi in China. Uh, it's it's for for most people that with with a job. I think it's affordable, um, and also um, and so far it does not uh, have the any signs that the unlike of uh, oral contraceptive, you can in some cases it can cause thrombosis, but that's actually for Dino Jazz, uh, no such report has been um, uh, put in. So, so in this case, I think that you can still use um, our contraceptive to treat um, symptomatic uh, um, endometriosis. The only thing is that, uh, as we now know, that the, for women with endometriosis, 10% uh, of women, they do not respond well to uh, progestin treatment simply because uh, they may have uh, CAMs mm. and their uh, progestin receptors may either be uh, reduced to risk expression or maybe uh, uh, hypermethylated. They ex essentially become silent. So they will not respond to progestin treatment. Does that actually answer you. your question? I think uh, uh, both of you answer very well. Uh, this is because I'm speaking from uh, a more senior gentleman's viewpoint because now we are teaching the younger doctors. Now, okay. I, I know there are still a lot of countries who really... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. It's not in case. Can you hear me? Okay, sure. Yes, yes. I know that a lot of countries, like what you said, they cannot afford to have didrogestron, which is Visan. Uh, so... It puts us as uh, senior doctors, teaching younger doctors, in a, a sort of a dilemma. Because in many countries, cost is very important. Right. And like what uh, Dr. Oleric said, after all, if the symptom goes away, uh, what harm have you done? And if you give it for another 20 years, 30 years, the lady would have gone into menopause. Really, what harm has it done? And in reality, for those of you who does a lot of laparoscopic uh, deep uh, endometriosis. Uh, it is not everybody that sees endometriosis will encounter such problems. I find that it's usually the very specialized hospitals and universities will, will tackle that sort of problem. So uh, my view is for uh, a respectable body evidence from, you know, from 
Thailand from uh, Professor Kwok and the rest of us, rest of us uh, who are who have experience with oral pills. Let's not uh, condemn the use of oral pills. Otherwise, it it condemns two things. Number one, the people, my teachers, my contemporaries have used oral pills. Number two, if something uh, happens in future, then you again. The, the lawyers who come after us and said, you, you, you guys did the wrong thing. I think we should have, have to be very responsible in what we say and not, and not like uh, uh, what I always said, don't cross the bridge and pull away the plank. I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. yep. I agree. Yeah. So I would like to ask uh, Professor Willard about the experience on uh, OCP and uh, in Thailand, we usually use the DMPA, dipomethoxyprogesterone uh, acetate a lot because it's very cheap. So Professor Willard, uh, can you uh, share the experience about the DMPA? No, actually, uh, first of all, I don't practice Yes, yes, please, Professor Sun, I, I, uh, this is uh, Professor Willard. Yes, so, uh, in, yes in, in Thailand, we, we use the MPA a lot in the past. Actually, at the present, we will still use the MPA as well. And uh, it worked quite well with the uh, endometriosis, especially the patients who has pain with the endometriosis. And, but but the, the side effect is an unwanted side effect that women might face is the obesity, increase, increased weight, and secondly is have a, a spotting that is uh, quite often. And in, in the long-term use of the, the MPA, the patients might have a menorrhea. I have a, one question uh, for Professor Sanway Go. Yeah. Do you uh, study of the camps in the patients who have a long-term use of the uh, the MPA or not? Well, we haven't actually. I, I, the CAM is actually just uh, reported uh, you know, three years ago mm. and we haven't done this any, not yet. I think that just last year, the Japanese team reported the, the adenomatic lesions carrying these CAMs actually had to lower progesterone receptor expression, and they are more resistant to adenogen treatment. And, and also probably will be same thing to uh, uh, refractory to uh, oral contraceptive treatment. But, Professor Sun, I have yeah. uh, the question for you. Uh, in China, do you use a lot of uh, DMTA to treat uh, endometriosis? Uh, MTA? DMTA. Depo, MPO, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Depo, medoxy, right now, they are actually switching to uh, Dinogest. I see. Yeah. Because it's about uh, 500 uh, Chinese yuan. So for people like uh, uh, working in Shanghai, they're affordable. And I think it's, it's, it's actually the, the insurance actually picks up uh, part of the, uh, the cost. I see. Because I think in Europe and in North America, they don't use a lot of uh, DMTA to treat right. uh, endometriosis just for the contraception. But I think right. in Asia, in Asia, we use a lot of uh, DMTA to treat right, uh, right. endometriosis. Uh, right now, I think that in our hospital, I think that probably the, uh, the, the, the doctors, they use more like uh, GNIH and agonist. And this part of the reason, I think, is because of the uh, pharmaceutical companies, they push harder. So. I see. So, and so. I see. So, I think this is really good uh, session, even we don't have a lot of the participants, but I think it's like a uh, kind of the panelist session. And by the way, uh, this month we have the meeting uh, hosted by uh, Professor Lee. Professor Lee, uh, could you please to share your your meeting? Oh, okay, sure. I, I don't have the dates offhand, but uh, basically, 
I have organized four webinars and I do it in such a way that it, it's uh, the speakers and panelists are mostly from Asia to give everybody a chance to know each other. Uh, secondly, I, I pick topics that are, for example, around the fibroids, but I wouldn't go into things like what is the fibroid and, and uh, how, how to operate on fibroid, but I will go into skills of uh, myomectomy. I go into a topic like uh, when do you operate, when not to operate, and I go into topics like uh, the complications of a fibroid myomectomy uh, so as to arouse discussions. Because I know if you talk about fibroids, the whole world knows about it. Then every webinar will have a topic on fibroids and a topic on a HIFU related to, to sort of solve those solutions like does it rupture? If I do a myomectomy, it will rupture in pregnancy. If I do a HIFU, will it rupture? And I will have another topic like uh, how does uh, the, uh, doctors in Korea in a private hospital uh, carry out the HIFU compared to somebody in a university or research or the, the birthplace of the HIFU. And my last, very last uh, webinar is uh, starring, starring uh, Dr. Olaric, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ai Xin Tzu, and uh, a few who are very interested, for example, from uh, Surabaya, Dr. Rally, who was interested in adenomyosis. So I just go on adenomyosis and, 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 and fertility and, and hope that we have a fruitful discussion. And I hope all of you will join me. I, I think the, the, the sponsors will send out the, the dates to each and every one of you. So I hope that uh, in Thailand, you join in. Uh, China, of course, will join in. Oh, by the way, I have one or two speakers who are very familiar with uh, uh, China because uh, some of them have uh, some of the professors and top people has come to Singapore to collaborate with them. And one is uh, Professor Bernard Chen. The other one is uh, uh, Dr. Bay. Uh, if you can't express yourself in English, you can speak to them in Mandarin. And that's why uh, I've invited them. Uh, so uh, these four webinars will be on next uh, Thursday and then a Tuesday and then the following two Thursdays about uh, 6.30 p.m. After, after office hours. So I hope all of you will join in. Uh, in, in a fruitful discussion, I promise you will be very clinical, uh, nothing so hardcore. But before I end, can I ask the experts, can I ask Professor Kuo and Olaric and even Vera a question on uh, endometriosis? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm talking about deep infiltrating endometriosis. Okay. Now, I, I believe the, the, the three of you are into uh, laparoscopy, endometriosis, and uh, even I think Professor Kuo is a board member of uh, SEUD, uh, and, and you are your um, uh, ISG, if I'm not mistaken, or e, EG. No. If you look at the anatomy of a, a lady, rectal vagina is actually vagina. Okay? Rectal vagina. Why are we not tackling rectal vagina endometriosis from the vagina end. Why are we always trying to do it from the laparoscopic end? You think of it, we call it the rectal vagina. We did not call it the rectal uh, sigmoid vagina. There's no sigmoid vagina. The whole vagina rectum is in. And all of us deliver babies. You look at the vagina day in and day out. Why don't we take it from the vagina end like the way we do uh, vagina hysterectomy, like the way the surgeons do uh, anterior Posterior resections. Why do we make things difficult for ourselves? May May I uh, refer this question to my uh, teacher, Professor Villa? Villa. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he taught me uh, since uh, fifteen years ago about the laparoscope. So I would okay, like to sure. refer this question, right. question to uh, Professor Villa. Professor. 
Actually, the uh, the rectal vaginal endometriosis we call that because this is in at, at the at, at at the septum septum of the uh, between the vagina and the, and the rectum. That that why we call this uh, rectal vaginal endometriosis. I think it might, this might might be the the anatomical anatomical concerns. Anatomy can concern about about the location of this. It might be but many 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 say that the cause uh, of the endometriosis in in the other size and the if leaf infiltrating endometriosis is the same. Uh, actually, I, I do I do agree with that in some part because the Samson theory cannot explain with that part. Uh, if that that might be, but. It uh, in the other way, the the, the from, from the cause, the treat the treatment is is different as well because in approaching of the endometriosis is easily to have the uh, resection in in the pelvis compared to the uh, some some complication that might happen during we excise the. Uh, deep infiltrating in, in viruses is different. That uh, some that is why if you have the uh, key answer for the uh, for the treatment of the of the diseases without any operation or without any intervention, it might be the best one. Or we might allow the patient to approach with the pause. That that might be an answer in the future. Uh, but meanwhile, in the reproductive age, with the DIE, sometimes is so painful and so, uh, and, and sometimes the quality of life of, of those patients is decreased a lot. No, I, I agree, but I'm saying uh, the, the way we are taught to do everything laparoscopic, are we, are we being too carried away by this concept of everything MIS because it is rectal vagina. So why did we think of the approach from the vagina? And even if we open in the rectum, it's no difference from if you do laparoscopy and open into the rectum. So I think the risk will probably be the same. Maybe maybe vaginal route is even safer because you can see with your eyes and open up and clear the endometriosis and, and clear... Uh, and close the mucosa again. If you open into the rectum, we usually do it the same way when we open into the rectum, mucosa, and close again. But, you know, why are we, as a concept, always think of laparoscopy when it is something down there, not not in the peritoneal cavity? Yeah. In yes, other words, uh, yes, why? why uh, I, I, I why? know, uh, so... Hmm. Sorry for for interrupt mm. you. The the sure. question or the vaginal approach. Uh, if you we actually we can we can do that. If you in in some colorectal surgeons that that do that do the uh, they, they do excise the the lower part of, of the rectum. Sometimes they do the uh, vaginal uh, transrectal approach instead of uh, uh, going into the uh, to, to the abdomen. We we can do in the same way. We can do the same way, but actually we have to 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 concern a lot because we we, we are not the colorectal surgeons, and we know that the complication that sometimes we unintended enter to the to the rectum and and has a complication is a catastrophe. That that is the thing we have to learn anatomy. I agree. We have to agree. to to learn that a lot, but it is it's, it's quite interesting because I see in some center they they do that approach as well in the transvaginal uh, and also the sometimes excise the transrectal excision of the lesion as well. Because I, 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 I well, when I, when I listen to all the presentations in the world, they will always say that I will do it laparoscopically with the presence of a, a colonic surgeon. They always say that. So in the department, there will be these two groups of people. So we're just thinking, why not take a chance Go vaginally, and if you don't have to go into the rectum, then you don't you don't really need to have a rectal surgeon. Uh, my my question is actually this: uh, to summarize it, 
instead of touching my nose this way, why are we trying to touch your nose the other way? That's my point. <laughs> So how about you, Professor Sun Wei? Do you have... Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, so I, I guess I cannot answer that question. But uh, from the, uh, the lesional development standpoint, I think that we now know pretty well that the why there's a difference between ovarian hematoma and also uh, deep infiltrating uh, hematosis. And that all... <clears throat> That's, that's about the, the microenvironment because the deep image intrusis is always surrounded by various uh, nerve plexus uh, and the nerves can actually secrete neuropeptides that actually facilitate the progression of the intrusis. And that makes the deep intrusis that's so different from uh, ovarian intrusis. That we do, we do not. But beyond that, uh, why why we shouldn't take the vaginal route? Uh, I, I have no idea. So sorry. Okay. So I think uh, the time is over. Okay. Good. By the way, I think this is very very uh, informative lecture and great talk. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of the expert here. So uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Sun Wei Kuo, for the lecture. And thank you for. Also, nice to see uh, Professor Vila and also Professor Lee, and we met before. Then, so. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, so see you soon, maybe in China yeah, stay or safe. in and Thailand or in Singapore. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye Professor Lee. Bye bye Professor Sanvoyko. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.